Now last week we looked at a psalm that said that God inclines his ear to us. And we talked about how joy and prayer are so intimately related. And here's this picture of a God who knows all things, knows our words before a word comes on our tongue. He already knows it all. And yet the psalmist wanted to bring up the point of God's attentiveness to us. And so he used this human figure of inclining his ear to me. Well, I have to ask the flip side, and I guess you might as well hear the questions I ask myself. How attentive am I am to what God says? Do I incline my ear to him, or do I dictate, well, why don't you do it this way, or why don't you do it that way? Do I have to read a book, and why do I have to think about it and meditate it? Why can't you just speak to me or appear in my living room? And I think God, because of his grace, doesn't overwhelm us with that. But the really question is, do I incline my ear to hear him? I want to talk to you again about another installment in this series about joy, and frankly, if there's one topic that this week I wish somebody else was preaching, this would be the one. Uh, Because as I shared with you, the whole thing about COVID has been highly disruptive, not only in terms of what we have planned, but what we are able to plan in the future. And then I put upon that the reality that I am in, oh gee, I dare say this, the waning days of my professional career. And I'm thinking, I want to finish well, you know? Uh, I, I don't want to whimper out. I'd like to go out with a bang, and yet COVID seems like a big whimper, and that's not much fun. Oh, by the way, I, I haven't announced a retirement date or anything like that, but um, I will, well, I might as well tell you news. Last week, Peggy and I celebrated our 42nd anniversary. That's pretty cool. And it's fun to live with your girlfriend when you love her and you're married to her, you know? And uh, we just celebrated that together. It won't be too long before I celebrate my 68th birthday. 68? Where did that come from? Uh, these realities are catching up with us, you know? And so the Word of God tells us that we're to number our days that we might present to Him a heart of wisdom. We're supposed to get smarter and more attentive as this goes on. And so COVID has been a wake-up for me. It says, am I doing that? My, my job is about studying the Word of God and presenting that, but do I study it for myself? And is my heart attentive? Because apparently... The joy I experience in life is intimately related to how attentive to God I am. Well, I want to talk to you today about joy and productivity, or fruit. We're going to zero in especially in John chapter 15. Let me read verses 1 through 17. I will warn you, we're going to reference about four chapters of Scripture. In fact, I would love it if you would do, you would love it if you would do this sometime today. Read John 13 through 17 in one sitting and do it out loud and get dramatic with it because it's a dramatic scene. But this whole thing with the upper room discourse has a theme that comes across where Jesus says, I am leaving and you are staying and then I'm going to come back for you and you'll be going and in the meantime, in the meantime, And so Jesus is transitioning the disciples from life as they knew it to, frankly, life as we know it. Where Jesus is not physically present, but he definitely is present in his word, in his spirit, in in the, the assembly of his people. And so here is one of those crucial instructions that comes in John 15, verses 1 through 17. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. 
If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be, what's the next word? Complete, full, whole. My commandment is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I do not call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. My joy in life is directly related to how I answer ultimate questions. Each of us has an answer to those. Maybe the answer is, I don't know, when we say stuck there, and that shows up in our experience of joy. But when we come through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, eyes open to our sin and to our need and to God and His provision and His righteousness, and how He perfectly accepts us because of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus that we begin to have a different perspective if we are really listening and straining to hear His voice, reading His Word and taking it to heart. I have joy that comes from the ability to answer ultimate questions like, is there a God and can I know Him personally? Can I tell you that the end of John 13 through 17, they have no doubt. One of the things that Jesus did to, again, clue again, was He said, I want to let you know that one of you will betray Me. And the, the text goes on to tell us that Jesus said that so that when it would happen, they would know that he came from God. How would he know that ahead of time? And why would he persist in patience with this one? So, is there a God? The question was answered for the disciples. Can I know him personally? They knew him personally, as can we. Why am I here on earth? Jesus spells that out again in this upper room discourse. What is my purpose? He makes it abundantly clear. What does, does what I do have any lasting significance? Or is it all vanity, vanity, well, vanity in the IRS? Well, these questions are not new. In fact, uh, as we go to this upper room discourse, we are in, if you will, final words of Jesus. And I thought it might be helpful for you to think through some final words that have been said uh, by some famous people, some notable people. For example, uh, Marie Antoinette apparently stepped on the executioner's toes uh, when she went to the, the uh, gala, or went to the execution, the guillotine, and she said, pardon me, sir, I did not do it on purpose. <laughs> uh, great last words. Uh, what else do we see in terms of last words? Well... Oh, Elvis Presley's girlfriend was present when he died. And she says his last words were, I'm going to the bathroom to read. How would those be for your last words? Uh, let's try some more last words. James Donald French, who was executed in an electric chair, came up with a cute one. Hey, ha fellas, how about a headline for tomorrow's paper, French fries? Little gallows humor. Okay. Uh, Philosopher Karl Marx, last words are for fools who haven't said enough. Oh, by the way, those were his last words. <laughs> Pondered that one. Uh, actress Joan Crawford, spoken to people who were praying at her bedside, she said, don't you dare ask God to help me. Don't you dare ask God to help me. Well, I hope that you are known for something other than uh, those kinds of statements. I've got one more to share with you later on, but these last words of Christ then become so instructive for how we are to live because he was bridging his disciples from where they were in his presence to where they would be in his absence, and that's where we find ourselves as well. Well, John chapter 15 we find some things out because of the important timing that Jesus tells us. Repeatedly he says, my time has come. Jesus knew that he was in his last phase of ministry. He knew the hour had come. I'm going to the Father. In a little while you'll see me no more. Father, the hour has come. I'm going to you. 
and this occurs right before the crucifixion. So the importance of this session is very timing. These are his knowledgeable last teachings. The next thing we notice about this upper room discourse is important themes. I'm leaving, you are staying, I'm returning, and then you're going with me. Do not let your heart be troubled, you believe in God. In my Father's house are many mansions, I go to prepare a place for you. He's leaving, he's coming again. He repeatedly tells them, love one another. He also talks about the denial, betrayal, one of you, Peter, all of you. In fact, as I was reading through, one of the things that stood out to me is how they were going to be scattered and each was going to go to his own home. (laughs) And I thought, well, that sounds like COVID. (laughs) And then he goes on and talks about their future together. You will have trouble in the world, persecution. You will be hated because of me. I give you peace, and then this one really jumped out. I want you to have my full joy. Five times he talks and teaches about joy in the course of his final words. And so this thing about joy and purposeful living, fruit in John chapter 15, it was on the heart of Jesus as he was leaving instructions for his people on how they're going to live and what should they expect. There will be trouble, yes, but you can have joy. Look at these occasions. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My commandment is this, love one another. Again, we find, I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. That's in John 16. Again, now this is the time of your grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. He speaks about it again. In fact, you know this as, well, we ought to do this out loud. The the review would do us good. The topic is assurance of answered prayer, and it's found where? Okay, so let's start over again. We say the topic, reference, verse, reference, assurance of answered prayer, John 16, 24, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. John 16, 24. And then one more time as he is speaking to his father and the disciples apparently under the guidance of the Holy Spirit get to eavesdrop on the prayer. They may have slept through it the first time, by the way. But here it is in the record because the Spirit informed them, I say these things while I'm in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Question, what qualities of life does Jesus want us to have? Well, one of them is he wants us to be joyful. He said there's going to be trouble, there's going to be persecution. In the world, you'll have difficulty. In fact, you're going to have to deal with the fact that I'm leaving you, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. And I want you to have joy, and I want you to have peace in this. So with his crucifixion, resurrection, ascension approaching, Jesus says he has completed the work the Father gave him. The 12 are ready, they just don't know it. And maybe, maybe we find ourselves in those situations where you're may, way more equipped by God than you realized till you got there. You know, like dads when they handed you the baby and you weren't sure which end to hold. You got the hang of it. You figured it out. Jesus tells the disciples their work will begin. In fact, in John 14, he tells them they will do even greater works because I'm going to the Father. They have work to do. They're going to be productive. Well, he's also in this upper room discourse giving them essential resources. He's taught them about the Holy Spirit who will come, another comforter. He talks about the word that will sanctify them, set them apart. The prayer, he lets them uh, uh, eavesdrop on that. And so they overhear the whole thing or are informed by the spirit of the parts they miss. The community of believers, the family of faith, they have all these resources. And so he goes on to teach them that you haven't chosen me, I've chosen you, and I've chosen you for a purpose, that you should go and produce fruit, and this is how you bring glory to the Father. What on earth is he talking about with this fruit thing? Well, when Jesus calls himself the vine, the true one, it's not the first time in Scripture that that occurs. Israel was called the vine. And so in Isaiah chapter 4, Isaiah chapter 5, there's this vine Israel. Israel was cultivated, protected by God, but failed to bear fruit. What was the fruit he was looking for there? He looked for justice, but he saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but he heard cries of distress. And so it's 
Not surprising that when this is given again by Jesus as the vine, there's the repeated theme that they're to love one another. As I have loved you, love one another. That the justice and the righteousness that should have been produced by the gracious calling of God to the nation, now he, the true vine, is going to produce that in the lives of his, of his people. All in the true vine will bear fruit. He further goes on to talk that the Father prunes us. Vineyards were commonplace. In fact, if we construct this sermon correctly, at the end of chapter 14, they leave the upper room and they are traveling and they're probably going through vineyards as we hit John chapter 15. They ultimately end up in Gethsemane where Jesus prays the prayer of John 17. And so this sermon that, well, if you read through it, by the way, time me and let me know, I think 20, 25 minutes, that would be a good length for a sermon, wouldn't it? And about halfway through, wouldn't it be great if you could stand up and walk around? That, that would be great, wouldn't it? Okay, just checking. You haven't lapsed into a mask coma, have you, by lack of oxygen, doing a little experiment here to see. So Jesus had them moving, and the whole thing maybe took 20, 25 minutes. And if you read it in one sitting, carefully, attentively, involving yourself, I think you're going to be amazed at what you see covered there. And so, the fruit is the whole point of having a vineyard. Israel called out of the polytheism of the ancient Near East, and then the same thing with Egypt. Now they were going to be God's own. And the fruit he was looking for was a different way that they treat each other based on a different relationship they have with their God. Changing a world broken by sin is the whole point of redemption this is how God will display his glory. We will bear much fruit. Or if you will, we are evidence. We are evidence. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness. The list continues on. Well, so this evidence that shows up, remain and abide, or live or stay, it's not only our relationship with Jesus, but it's also the relationship with what we produce. Your works will remain or stay. You'll bear fruit, much fruit, fruit that will last. And so what was God looking for from the first vine? Justice. Righteousness. I hope amidst all the clutter and noise of current events, including things like Black Lives Matter, that we do hear that justice and righteousness matters to God. Now we have a strange way of mixing our agendas and all kinds of other things in there, but these are hard issues for God. In fact, people who love one another treat them with great value, and it shows in all kinds of ways, including justice and righteousness. So what would God be looking for in the true vine branches? Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is the fruit that's going to endure. The fruitless are gathered up and burned, and probably referring specifically to Judas, who he said was going to betray him, but he was among them, and they didn't immediately start uh, uh, throwing saltines at Judas when he said, one of you is going to betray me. Uh, their, their upper room Passover feast Elements were not the objects to throw at Judas. No, they had no clue, apparently. They thought he was out to uh, distribute money for the poor, but Jesus knew the fruitless. If justice and righteousness are the fruit God is looking for from Israel, what's he looking for from us? I don't think it's a particular party affiliation. I don't think it's a particular channel that we listen to or tune out. I do think it's how well we tune into the heart of God and how strongly we depend on Him and how that connects with the people in our lives around us even when we're supposedly not supposed to connect. We've got to find a way. And so this is why I wish somebody else would preach this message today because it's like the pinnacle of my frustrations right now. How do I be fruitful? Fruit that will last when I can't even shake somebody's hand. Huh. Well, 
Fruit is the real life of the vine seed and the branches. Please get out of the whole thing. Is he talking about souls one for Christ or Holy Spirit fruit? If it was true in the life of Jesus, it needs to be true. In a, is it talking about acts or actions? Well, how are you going to know if you loved if somebody doesn't do stuff? Or how are you going to know joy if somebody doesn't live it or say it? Or how are you going to know peace if people are at war with you? And so all of these involved actions, but it's the real life of the vine expressed, especially in loving God back and loving your neighbor well. And so let's have a hmm, survey. Would fruit affect wearing a mask or not? Uh, the votes for yes. The votes for no. The votes for I'm not going to cast a vote. Thought maybe I'd get you on that one. <laughs> it is a love one another issue. And love often inconveniences us and limits our rights and privileges. Let's talk about COVID 19 and John 15. Maybe you'd rather I flip the order John 15 and COVID 19. I just want to give you a little perspective as I think about this passage and see about our lives today. This is not the first time the people of God have been threatened by crippling fear, and some of us are old enough where we've read a history book or two. I've been reading a one-volume history of the U.S., which has been so good, and what's been clear is all through the, our nation's history, there have been times when there's been a, a panic, a hysteria. Think of uh, the Great Depression, the collapse of the banking industry. Real fear that became reality whether it was the Red Swarm of McCarthy, where there's a communist everywhere and through the government, and who can you trust? Hitler's blitzkrieg sweeping across Europe, what can stop him? Uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, a few of us remember that. I can remember people digging bomb shelters in their backyards. But you can probably remember Y2K, when everything was going to maybe melt down, and now you wonder about, what am I going to do with all that leftover stuff? Uh... Stock market, mortgage meltdown. Well, Jesus said, you will have trouble, but finish the verse. But be, well, King James, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So I think we have to see this as God pruning us of familiar routines, familiar places, familiar methods, familiar interactions. According to John 15, why does the Father prune? Thank you for not yelling, being considerate. And you notice that people knew I might yell. So, back on the edge. Why does the Father prune us? That we might bear more fruit, much fruit, more fruit, and bring the Father glory because of that. I would suggest that in these days of COVID inconvenience, the hand of God is at work in the hearts of His people. Because we have to think, we have commands to obey because we love him. Now, how are we going to do that? Jesus promised complete joy. He also promised separation, trouble, and mourning. Jesus promised greater works, fruit that would last. Holy Spirit, we will see him face to face, Jesus said. Faith in God is the heart of this fruit. So coronavirus is not greater than the great physician. Amen? Amen. So we need to stop living in fear. And we live in a sea of fear pandering. When you turn on the media and you have conversations, you're supposed to be afraid enough to do something about it. And I, my fear is there's only one we need to fear. What else do we learn about COVID-19 and John 15? <laughs> It appears that COVID restrictions will be with us for some time. And all God's people said, boo. <laughs> and so the question is, are we going to hunker down and just like live independent lives and cancel everything and not meet together? Or are we going to look to hold fast to what Jesus has called us to do? I appreciated the testimony you shared earlier about more time with God and more time with each other. And I think that's pretty fantastic. 
I'm not too sure, but if I were God, aren't you glad that that's never going to happen? That maybe I wouldn't shut down a whole bunch of stuff that distracted us to what our lives are really about too. And call people back to being really attentive to God and His Word. And calling people back to be really attentive to their marriage and their home life. I don't think that's surprising. But let's ask God to show us ways that we can bear much fruit in our faith. That we might be faithful in COVID times. And I guarantee you there's going to be these two components. We're going to have to connect with God and we're going to have to connect with people. I think I'm getting the hang of this Zoom meeting thing a little bit. It's almost like people being there. No? Almost. And then, I don't know if it was a squirrel, a branch, or whatever, something Thursday night took down my internet. <laughs> I thought, well, I can't do the Zoom meetings or the Hangout thing, but I still have a phone that I can text and call with, and I still have a car I can drive in. Am I going to hunker down and not connect? I think love is going to find a way. So, how are you doing on your answers to ultimate questions? Is there a God, and can you know Him personally? And would he be worth pursuing if you could? Why am I here on earth? What's my purpose? Has the word of God spoken to that? It's how we might remain in him and him in us, and he's going to produce through us loving actions both toward him and toward people, whatever those may be, as the situation you're going to call for. We'll have to take initiative. Does what I do have any lasting significance according to John 15? Fruit that will last. Fruit that will endure. Okay. Well, I need to tell you about this guy since we had some other words earlier. But uh, this guy is Michael Faraday, and I was interested to read about him. Aldous Huxley, who was quite an author, uh, you may have read some of his stuff, said that if he had the choice to have been born as somebody else and his choice was Shakespeare, he's the author, or Michael Faraday, he said, I think I'd choose Michael Faraday. Einstein had uh, a few pictures on his wall, one of those, John Newton, another, Einstein put up, Michael Faraday. And so previous generation, we may not be as conversant of it, but every time you use an electric motor or anything that has to do with magnetism, you can owe that to the research done by Michael Faraday, who was a brilliant guy. Here's his last words. I shall be with Christ, and that is enough. I shall be with Christ, and that is enough. And if all the other things in our life are whittled away, if we're going to be with Christ, and that is enough, that is enough. We will bear fruit, and fruit that will last, and our joy will be complete. Hey, read with me our memory verse. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit.